Welcome to Leveling the Fit Life Podcast, episode 55. I'm your host, Chad Mueller. And today I will be joined by Coach ADJ, Adam DeJong, but he's running a little bit late. He's getting his hair did. Um, but I got our, our host and one of our local fitness freaks in the KW community, Greg Nyhoff, owner and trainer of 1440. How's it going, Greg? Going well, Chad. Thanks for having me. Yes, real pleasure having you on the pod. Uh, for those uh, who follow Greg, he's a beast. Tall dude like myself, tall and strong. I think that's how, I, I met, that's how we got connected. That's right. That's right. That's right. I called you out on the, the gluten and oats, I think it was. And then we met and I was like, I'm a pretty tall guy. But then I saw you. I'm like, holy shit, this guy's got a few inches. <laughs> that let's Let's add a point of clarification to that. Chad out of the blue commented on one of my Instagram stories, aren't all oats gluten free? And I was like, who the hell is this guy? Like, what is, <laughs> like I, I don't know, probably all oats are gluten free. I'm just out here trying to help people make a healthy breakfast. <laughs> and Chad comes at me with that one. And then I realized he was like seven feet tall as well. So we have a, we have a bond that not many other people understand in this community, which is good. Yeah. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I sort of called you out, and then we met at uh, one of the at one of the gyms at some point. And I was like, "Oh my god!" And I com- completely forgot. And then you called me out. And I was like, "Shit!" Yeah, you're right. I called you out. <laughs> oh, look at that yeah. boy! Yeah. Looking there he is. Mint, eh? oh, there we go. How's- looking fresh, Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy Neutron has joined the chat. Whoa! There he is. Looking Amazing. Good. Yeah, it's a new feature for uh, Living the Fit Life Podcast. We're going to start p- posting our videos, so you get to see uh, see what we're talking Damn. about. But Coach ADJ is looking pretty solid there. That. Looking, little, looking slick. <laughs> On the road oh. like a real CEO, too. This is Hustling. Legit. Haircuts <laughs> midday. Just hustling. How about that? But that That's is. a real business executive move. I like it. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Well, thanks for joining, Adam. Um, yeah, Greg. So, like, uh, we're we're uh, June twenty fourth. We're recording this a few days after your big intro into endurance sports. I mean, I guess first off, like, you're six six two forty, big dude. Um, you jumped into a fifty k ultra race. How how's the body feeling? A few days after, I that. First of all, thank you. The uh, the height is a little bit padded there. I'm six four. Okay. Okay. Um, I do look up. I do look up to Chad. I just you know someone's gonna hear six six, and I don't want to misrepresent myself. Six uh, four. The two forty is accurate though. I did see a two thirty nine on the scale last week, which was concerning before the ultra marathon. But um, no, we're we're almost a week out. It was it was last Saturday. And um, I'm not just saying this because we're on a podcast. I feel pretty good. So, all right. I think that was a good. Uh, I mean, you look fresh. I mean, we didn't we didn't schedule this for the Monday after for a reason. <laughs> Saturday afterwards would have been pretty bad. I think even Monday I was I was probably okay. Okay, recovered yeah. quick then. Nice. I think, yeah, I think so. I think so. And I was going to ask you, Adam. An ultra, a 50k ultra in the endurance world. Since you are an endurance expert, would you compare that to an Ironman or a half Ironman, or is there anything you compare I, that to? I told you this before, Chad, when we were when we were preparing to have Greg on the podcast. I said, "Man, this is like no joke." 50k, you know the the thing about triathlon or Ironman is you get to do three different sports. When you choose to do an ultra marathon, you're in it. You're in it for the long haul and you only get to, you know, be on foot. So your body just takes a beating. And I think, I think Greg, his comment about his recovery is a sign. Like if you did the work or not to prepare, that kind of dictates how long your recovery is going to take. So pretty impressive that it also tells me you had a little more in the tank too, but uh, whatever, we'll get we'll get around to that no i'm just that it's amazing like first time around most people they don't prepare enough one two they don't have obviously you had a good wingman because you guys paced it super smart and you were 
even the whole time. I saw you said your last K was your best K, and so that's that's impressive. Thanks, man. No, I, I appreciate that. And it's funny you mentioned that, like, about preparing appropriately, because now a week removed, in hindsight, like, knowing how bad 43 to 48 felt, as I kind of like recapped in my newsletter today, and this is something I expected we would talk about, I actually wish I would have run further in a training run. Like our longest mm. training run was 35 kilometers two weeks before the race. And aside from that preparation, I didn't do a whole lot of research as far as like, you know, how far should I be running to prepare for a 50K ultra? I just knew that personally I needed to hit a certain amount of, of mileage, I guess, kilometerage, if that's a thing, um, in order to feel like comfortable with taking on 50 kilometers. But like I said, in hindsight, I wish we would have done a training run that was over 40 kilometers because once we hit 36 K, we were in kind of uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, five kilometers on its own doesn't seem like much, but anything over 40, all of a sudden it's a very different game. And I think that's why marathons are 42 kilometers. And Adam could probably speak to that in a lot more detail than I can. Yeah, I, he's run a few of them. I don't know that. I don't know the, the science behind the kind of training plan for 50 K, but I know for a marathon, like your longest run is usually around that 35 K mark. So it probably makes sense that you would have stretched it out ideally to usually it's time based, right? So you're usually like trying to target like yeah. a similar amount of time on your feet that it's going to take you to do the race so that, you know, instead of like, Oh man, I'm 35 K in, you're like, okay, I'm, you know, four hours in or whatever it might be at that time. But yeah, you're, I think, you know, you taper going into the race. So in theory, that will, that will give you a little, a few extra Ks, right? And then you would have had a, a, a lot of weekly mileage going into that 35K run too. So you, you did, you did most things pretty damn right which is cool. Yeah, I, I, I want to, like, let's just send it here on the podcast and really get into this endurance thing because I think for most people that follow you, Greg, you're not an endurance athlete. So I have to ask the first question, like, why did you get, where does the idea come from to jump into endurance? And then why take on this go big or go home mentality as soon as you jump into it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure if I have like a really profound answer to that. Um, if I'm being honest, like <laughs> I did, I did CrossFit a lot for a long time. Right. And I, that was kind of how I met, um, well, it's kind of how I met you guys and spent a lot of time with the Polskis who just had on the podcast too. And I think you get used to like that, that pain and suffering that's associated with CrossFit and um, using that to transition and start my own business and just like spend a ton of time in a, in a functional fitness space. CrossFit mm -hmm. in the last probably five years has become like very gym specific, right? Especially if you want to train for the open and progress through those first few stages. And then you get to the CrossFit games and things are like a lot more interesting as far as You've got outdoor events, you've got swimming, paddling, running, and like more endurance components that, that you guys incorporate into your training as well. And I think the truth is that I just, I started to just feel like really sick of being in the gym and wanting to be outside more and, and testing my fitness that way. So that was one draw. And then mm -hmm. in terms of taking on 50K, like the first thing my wife asked me when I signed up, she was like, You've never even done a marathon. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm aware. Um, but my meathead logic was like, well, if you can run 42, you can probably run 50. Um, and I really regretted that during the miserable stretch of the 50K run that was 43 to 40. That was her. Kilometers. That was her telling um, you. Told, told you so. 
<laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah, and as much as it pains me to say, she was probably right. Um, but I think we were both right because I had the confidence of like X number of years of training, whether it was CrossFit or strength and conditioning for football or like the little bit of endurance training that I had done leading up to the 50K. It's like, well, I know what it feels like to be uncomfortable. And so I can count on that for five to seven kilometers, even if the training isn't quite there. So, um, yeah, and it really comes down to it. I just wanted to do something. I wanted to do something that was going to challenge me in a, in a totally different sport where I had like nothing to compare it to. Because that's the hardest part about training with guys like Adam and Nick and having this like, 10 year history of CrossFit and strength and conditioning. It's like, you can hit a great snatch or you can hit a really solid Fran time or a Murph time, but you're going to look back and say, well, in 2017, when everything was different, you know, I was 13 minutes faster on Murph or you can do it next to Polsky and he's already on his second lap and you're just, you know, chipping away at your push ups, And so, for some reason, when they transition to an endurance sport, it's like, I'm not actually worried about, I'm not going to this race to win. I'm going to the race because I want to see if I can run 50 kilometers. That's awesome. I love that. I love, yeah, that's, yeah, I love that. I love that you're just curious and you want to test yourself and, and like, just jump in completely i mean it sounded like you're fairly confident like i mean you didn't seek out sort of an endurance coach like i guess my question i guess another question would be like you seem pretty confident with your base knowledge of fitness that you could sort of pivot and sort of transform that into an endurance sports which i mean endurance isn't c crazy different it's still a feat of strength and fitness so you felt pretty confidently that you could sort of with the knowledge that you had you could sort of build up a training program that would be suitable for yourself that would get you pretty close. Like you felt pretty confident in your training plan. Obviously you said you recovered. So like Adam was saying, it sounds like you were pretty successful. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there was, there was certainly some trial and error along the way. Um, I guess another reason why I wanted to do this is because it was going to force me to be really consistent. It's pretty mm. easy to uh, waver on a training plan that you create for yourself when you train on your own, when you don't have anything to train for. Cause this week it's like, well, I feel like lifting heavy. So I'm going to lift heavy this week, but I probably wouldn't behave that way if I was preparing for a power lifting meet, right? Cause any coach would say, well, you just totally interrupted the periodization of this plan if power lifting was your goal. So having a date on the calendar that was X number of weeks away, forced me to be a little bit more disciplined and consistent and say like, well, I can't just put on my shoes and, and run whatever distance I feel like, like I need to manage my training volume in a way that's going to help me peak and taper for this event. And so that was a big thing that I think helped with not only the confidence, but just helped me personally stay a little bit more consistent um, with my training, which is something that I think I've kind of lacked in the last couple of years. Yeah, there's nothing like the accountability of endurance training and consistency because if, I, I mean, it's the same in the gym, but your your risk of injury if you try to do anything uh, out, of, out of plan or out of order is just so high. You know, you can't go from 10K a week to 40K a week and expect to, to keep that trend going. You have right. to, you have to be on a progressive build, um, to achieve success. So it's so true. Yeah. And that was always kind of in the back of my mind was like, and, and running is one of those things that's, it's unlike, or I guess I should say endurance because I'm sure it's yeah. the same with triathlons for you, Adam, but those sports are like, it's not like, most of the time, a power clean feels the same. Sure, some days you've got a little bit more snap in the hip and things, you know, your timing seems to be better. But I always find it interesting how you can go out for a run on Tuesday and it feels absolutely terrible. And then you can go for a run on Thursday and it's like, well, I could run all day if I wanted to. Like, I don't know if I've ever experienced anything that can be so varied. And so hmm. 
on those runs when I felt really good, that was always in the back of my mind. Like I can't just add mileage because I feel good because hard runs are coming. And at the same time, I can't just, you know, mind over matter this run and totally botch this week's training volume because that's going to mess up next week. And then, you know, I'm going to really be paying for this on race day. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, you remind, you're reminding me so much of, I got into endurance training and triathlon for exactly the same reason. Just like looking for something different, looking for a challenge that was like, not me versus everyone else. It was just me versus me. And I want to conquer this and finish this, but the training style as well. When I first started, just like you, just tons of athletic experience and, and, you know, suffering and persevering. Like I just trained obviously following some structure, but more off, like when I had the confidence to, to do the race, like I knew that was a feeling, not necessarily like a targeted number of hours or kilometers. It was more just like, okay, like you said, I know I can get seven more kilometers out of myself just from experience as an athlete, you know, and that's so true. And we try to explain this to even experienced athletes, like in their particular sport, like you really have to feel prepared and feel ready in order to succeed, whether you are, you aren't, it's mentally, you have to feel like you can do this and you can, you can crush it. Yeah. That's, that's such a good point. And to compare it to past sport experiences, I actually wrote about this in one of my newsletters. Um, the, the title of that essay was called Hay, Hayes in the Barn. And that's, I don't know if mm-hmm. you ever heard that expression playing hockey. Yeah, Adam. absolutely. Um, but our, our football coaches yeah. would always say it when I was at Laurier. And I was always kind of like, you know, it'd be Friday night walk through the day before a big game. And I was like, yeah, we, we did everything. We did the practices. We watched the film. But personally, you were always kind of like, was it enough? You know, like there's, there's too many things we can't control tomorrow, like the weather, the other team, you know, the 11 other guys on the field, you know, you can, you have a a much smaller scope of control. And I think training for this race, like the week leading up to it, knowing that like I did, I ran the kilometers I was supposed to run for the last four months. I did the long training run. And I think this was the first time where I actually felt like, excited because I actually was like, yeah, the hay is in the barn. Like there's nothing else that I need to do. I can rest. And I was actually excited to, to run the race. And that's something I don't think I've ever experienced before, which is I'm using that more often. That's awesome. In the barn, baby. (laughs) Love it. Yeah. That's right up your alley for sure. (laughs) Anyone who's ever been in the the locker room will will die when they hear that, but (laughs) love it. (laughs) It is totally it's on brand. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, like, I have to ask, I know Adam's been, uh, I don't want to say criticized, but labeled as a pretty big dude in the endurance world. <laughs> Obviously, Adam looks like a strong person. Um, he doesn't have the stature that you have, Greg, but like you were mentioning to, I, I think a few times in your socials about sort of the Clydesdale endurance. Like you're a big dude. Like I got, like, were there any sort of chatter, or any looks that you're getting on your race? Like, what are you doing here? Like, what is this guy doing? Um, if there were, I, I didn't pick up on them. Okay. Um, All right. That's what's interesting about these races, though. I think I certainly had it in my mind. And, and you know, Adam, well, both of you guys are great examples of, like, not succumbing to your stereotypes. And I think that's something that I think about a lot, right? It's someone mm-hmm. will look at you and assume that, okay, you were a hockey player guy, so you're going to be really good at the high-intensity anaerobic efforts which you are, but you can also go and do an Ironman triathlon, which is pretty damn cool. And I think it's a great representation of just like what it means to actually plan, prepare and train for something. Um, The Clydesdale run club thing was, it's kind of a joke, but also not a joke at this point. No, man, that's great. (laughs) I bought the domain and that's a story from 
the first organized race I ever did with my wife, who is my girlfriend at the time. We did the Waterloo 10K. And this is back when I was like, I'm doing CrossFit. I can do anything. <laughs> and I wasn't doing much running. And I got absolutely crucified by this 10K run. And uh, I had like Beats headphones on and she had headphones on. And we, we ran next to each other the entire time. Our pace was all over the place. It was like 100 degrees in the shade. And this old guy ran up behind me and he was like, are you in the Clydesdale category? I, like, I don't even, I don't even know what that means. And he just kind of like, he just blew by me. And this guy was like 95 years old. And uh, that just like stuck with me for a long time. I looked it up afterwards and it's any runner in an yeah. endurance event that's over 200 pounds, but there's not actually like an explicit category for it, but it just kind of stuck. And a lot of times when I'm, especially when I'm going downhill, I feel a bit like a, uh, like a maimed horse. <laughs> I'm tired on those runs, but I think it's going to stick, man. I, I don't know what it's going to be yet, but I bought the domain. So we'll see what happens. Hey man, I'm, I, I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm involved in any way capacity that you want it to be. I love it. I love, I mean, we have to embrace it, right? Like I know I've heard like, uh, in CrossFit, like the rig, rig shaker. I know a bunch of commentators <laughs> talk about some of the tall athletes, you know, so-called six two, <laughs> close to two hundred pound tall athletes, but like you got to embrace that kind of stuff. I love it, love it. Wear it yeah. as badge of honor. <laughs> Rig shaker, that's a good you one. know. And I, I, I think before. to go along with that, just so you know, miss there is go. there. There is something so important in endurance sports about being strong, and not not like I'm talking like pound for pound strong, because from 40 to 50 K when you are depleted, but you have, uh, you know, 500 pound deadlift and 400 pound squat in your back pocket. Like you just have this intrinsic strength that no matter how fatigued you are, you don't break down. And all of my endurance buddies that, you know, see me for the first time and are like, what is this guy doing? But then over time start to be like, okay, like he's doing something that, that works the buy-in of, of pound for pound strength. Like in cycling, it's all about Watts per kilo, but no one ever thinks about like, well, what if I could, you know, have uh, a percentage of body weight, you know, back squat or like, it's all going to add to your ability to, move more efficiently, move stronger. And when everyone else is breaking down in a race, you're, you have the ability to stay, stay strong and keep your mechanics good. And really it comes down to that in hour four to five or an hour eight to nine, or, you know, it's, it's so important. I think Greg has that, you know, like, I think that paid a big, big factor in his, first ultra race is that he does have that strength and he and you kept the strength training going which is really cool yeah i didn't i didn't want to give that up like well mark bell talks about this a lot and he probably even trademarked it right he always mm -hmm. says strength is never a weakness and i think at a bare minimum to your point adj about like Okay, if you're someone that can do this endurance event, but you also hold the ability to to deadlift and squat a heavy weight, um, at the very at a bare minimum, your ability to yeah. recover is is going to be elevated, just because like mm -hmm. the connective tissue and the joint function is already there, and those are usually the issues that, at, at least from what I've seen, and this could be wrong, but those are usually the issues that like endurance athletes will struggle with mm -hmm. they're so aerobically developed but in terms of like muscular endurance it's just it's it's almost too sport specific right like they don't have the the central nervous system efficiency that someone who has a background of strength training might have and that, that's, that's you, the, okay, yeah i was gonna say that's what you've noticed too uh, adam like with the lp endurance crew like the addition of strength-based training has really yeah. helped your your crew Right, a lot of the feedback that we like, I've heard from them is that it's a huge asset. Versus before they were weren't introduced to it, they might have yeah, done some stuff, but not it, consistent. No, a hundred percent. And it's the 
athletes that have grown up doing endurance sports that really benefit from it the most. And it's so interesting to see hmm. who is naturally strong and then how we compare then those athletes to how strong they are uh, late in a race. And it's just the direct correlation is kind of scary. We have some ladies in our club that like, when you look at them, you would think that they've never done strength training before. And, you know, we had a huge buy-in over the winter this year and they come to the gym. They haven't squatted in years and they have this just natural ability to move full range and just like they're squatting their body weight in, you know, less than a month. Right. So it's, it's so cool to see. And then, and then you do that compared comparison for like an everyday endurance athlete who with a bar on their back is unstable. Right. And then you now are, are like, okay, do you really need to do that extra run workout a week or do you need to get stronger? Right. Like where are you going to see the most bang for your buck? And your joints will thank you tremendously in 10 years from now, if you have some, like, like Greg was saying, some structural kind of integrity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's cool. No. Um, so yeah, so sounds like we've pumped your tires, Greg, successful ultra. Are you staying in endurance here? Are you going to do another one? Are you diving deeper? Like what's your plan? He just After commented on Nick Bear's Instagram Man, post and said uh... he's up for a 50 mile, which is 80k run in Texas. What overnight? <laughs> Adam oh, have uh, Adam has oh, my yeah. Instagram That's activity right. on his notifications, I guess. But Adam, well, Adam's I following the same guy. He's back. putting a comment I'm right after it, so it makes back. sense. <laughs> Adam and I are gonna. I would How love to go and cheer you on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Yeah, I haven't. Could run that I no still problem. have a, a a fear of running for more than I don't know three or four or five hours straight. For some reason, I don't know why, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's founded. Um, <laughs> to answer your question, I haven't uh, I haven't run yet, so I'm planning to do a run tomorrow, which will be a week after the ultra okay. marathon, and I don't want to make any decisions um, until I've had a chance to to put a few more kilometers on the road. Now that being said, I got back from the ultra on Saturday, and my next door neighbor was outside, and he was like, "Oh, were you guys at the cottage?" Because my wife was with me. And uh, we were like, no, we were up in Niagara. And I didn't want to say like, oh, just we're an ultra marathon. Uh, uh -huh. But I was like, we were in Niagara. And he's like, oh, what were you doing there? And then Jordan's like, Greg ran an ultra marathon. He's like, oh, is it like one of those 100K <laughs> races? And I was like, no, it was just, it was just 50. Just the and disappointment. Kind of like, oh, man, you know, because in terms of, in terms of ultra running, like, 50k is is like buying yeah. the end an intro an intro yeah yeah sure um and i i wrote about this in my my newsletter today it's like you don't have to do much google searching to find something apparently all you have to do is uh you know follow my every move <laughs> on instagram and you can find a 50 mile race overnight uh, like uh like adj did <laughs> but no i'm i'm considering doing another one uh but i don't want to does that get you Same more excited yeah. about right. running but you enjoyed than the... doing like a 10K or a half marathon for like speed, ultras, just conquering them? Yeah, cool. I think for now, yeah. You know what gets me more excited than the actual like right. the conquering the event is one thing, which I think is really cool. But what I've noticed this past week and I said to Chad before we started recording is like, I, he asked me if I had trained yesterday and I haven't, which is kind of strange. Um, I've just been feeling a little bit aimless, right? Without yeah. the running, without having something to train for. That forced consistency and discipline just started to bleed into like every other area of my life. And that's kind of what I, having something on the calendar can do, right? I, I think otherwise the summer just kind of gets away from you. 
and it's easy to just kind of, you know, go based on feel and not really do a whole lot. And all of a sudden it's like happy new year. And you look at last year and it's like, okay, well, what could I have done if I was just a little bit more focused and intentional? So I think that's kind of more of my draw for considering another event. Cool. Cool. Um, I know we, I know we jumped into the endurance stuff, but I feel like it was smart to get it out to talk about it, but I do want to talk about sort of your fitness journey in general. Obviously we brought this up a lot of times. A lot of the people that come on the podcast, they have a similar background, somewhat competitive sport background to whatever level that might be. They move on from that. And then sometimes there's a lull in their training or maybe there's not, or some sort of transformation. So you were a former Waterloo warrior football player, a big unit for sure. No. Oh no. No. My bad. Unbelievable. I'll have to cut that out. Did Polsky, did Polsky put you up to this? No, no. I got you guys mixed up. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Yeah. And the, in the worst one, my bad. Actually, I might keep that in. (laughs) Yeah. Well, someone, you're going to get some text messages. You and Nick, that's for sure. (laughs) Okay. My bad. My bad. I, I did want to, I wanted to ask, like, what was your training like, like back then when you're playing football, competitive football, like what was your training like then? And then my second question, what, which I'll ask is like, how did you find CrossFit or were you doing CrossFit back when you were doing football? Yeah. So I played Laurier. I played at Laurier. Thank you for stating um, that. No problem. Just had to make sure that that was on the record. And I wanted to also make sure that Adam heard it so that he doesn't start spreading any more rumors. Um, my So it's, it's funny. Football was kind of like my introduction to strength and conditioning because in high school, I was uh, really skinny. And uh, I grew up playing soccer for a really long time. I grew up in the States, actually. And when you grow up as a young athlete in the States, it's like you – whatever sport you kind of settle on, it doesn't even have to be a sport, whatever thing you settle on, it could be music, it could be theater, it could be sports, it could be art, whatever. It's like, that's what's, that's what I think draws people to the United States is like, they're all in on that thing. And mm-hmm. there's like a ton of support and not that you're kind of like forced to specialize, but you're culturally, you're incentivized to like, take this thing as far as you can. So when I moved to Canada, when I was in high school, I kind of had that, that mentality and that just like assumption going into sports. And so I started playing football when we moved here. And then as a result, got introduced to strength and conditioning, because I think you just kind of assume if you're going to play football, you need to be, you know, bigger and stronger than you are currently. And that pursuit kind of never ends. So I started training at a place in Waterloo called uh, SST, Sports Specific Training. Um, And it was over in North Waterloo. You guys probably know where it is. Um, Mm -hmm. And I did that every off season um, for preparing for for Laurier football season. And that training was like pretty, pretty classic strength and conditioning, you know, a good blend of, of squatting, deadlifting, bench pressing, obviously, because that's football. And then like some speed and agility work and some, some functional conditioning, Um, but very like periodized according to the football season, which was every fall. And then somewhere in my second or third year at Laurier, the SST gym was actually right across from CrossFit Waterloo. And this was an, this would have been probably 2012, 2013 when like more and more CrossFit gyms were starting to Mm -hmm. pop up. And at that time, you know, like all the, all the football guys would be in the gym and we'd kind of like look across the parking lot, see these people like trying to do double unders and power snatches and, you know, flowing around on a bar. And like, we like kind of made fun of it. Like it, you know, it was this thing that, that wasn't really that interesting. And then one of my roommates in university actually who played football, um, but had to stop playing football because of some concussion issues um he was looking for something to kind of stoke his competitive fire and so he actually ended up at that crossfit gym and you know he he kind of similar to like probably our first experience he came back he's like man you got to try this thing like 
it was so much fun. It was like the hardest work I'd have ever done. And he started sending me these YouTube videos and um, I ended up going to a CrossFit division during one off season. Sometime in the winter, there were a few other friends at Laurier who were kind of getting involved and interested in CrossFit and they took us there. And yeah, I mean, at the same way, it kind of captured my attention and totally changed my belief system on like CrossFit as a methodology. So I went and got my level one. I started coaching, just trained as much as I could and had to be a little bit calculated about it around football season to make sure that and I wasn't going to overdo it leading into those seasons. Um, and then towards the end of football, just all I wanted to do was, was CrossFit. I wanted to focus on being a coach and see if I could potentially be competitive because CrossFit as a sport was like really starting to take off in that time, like mm-hmm. 2014, 2015, kind of like the golden era of uh, did the you start com- game. Did you, after football, did you start competing in CrossFit? Um. I don't even know. Like local, I mean. local competitions, stuff like that. Not a ton. No. Um, no, which is kind of funny because I really loved it and I wanted to, to compete and be good at it. Um, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't that good at it. Like I picked up the skills, and but I was never, you know, I was never close to like semifinal level fitness, like Adam or Polsky. Um, even for all those times of, of training, like I was always, biased towards strength events in CrossFit, which are never tested in the open or the semifinal. Um, sorry, the, the quarterfinals now, but, uh, yeah, I just, I never, I was never able to crack into that like top 10%. That's so, yeah. Uh, I would say not yeah. crack into the top 10%, I've... not crack into the top one, not crack. Yeah. Into the top I was going to say, <laughs> but yeah, great. Well, great you're in the 10% great. freakish ability to, do gymnastics extremely well, weight lift extremely well, has crazy strength. But yeah, you're right. It's almost just like the sport wasn't set up. If you could have just fast-tracked to the games, you probably could have been like, no, like a, if we're talk, like a, more like a... The best rig you know, shaker like out Pukowski, there. Like yeah. you, you move really well. You could, you know, like you just, the open was not designed for you. Yeah. And for you. And that's like, none of me is like sour about that and never will be, but I would also never say that. Um, so for like, for me to be objective and evaluate myself, it's funny. I, I when I used to work for a, a tech company, I had to do quite a bit of traveling and I'd always drop into like a CrossFit gym wherever I was. And they'd be like, oh, like, you know, it's so, it must be so tough to be a big guy and do this. And it's like, yeah, but okay. So I've got to move a barbell further but I'm also stronger. You know what I mean? So it's like, I never saw it as like this, this disadvantage, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So that's, and I, and I never thought that was fair. It's like, well, you start playing that game of like, well, if I was shorter, if I was lighter, would I be better at gymnastics? And it's like, maybe, you know, and if the, if these events were set up differently, but it's like, yeah, they're not. And that's the best part about CrossFit. It's like, you need to have the ability to like do engine workouts, suck wind. uh, If you want to get to this next stage and, and earn yourself the opportunity to lift heavy weights. And uh, I just wasn't able to to figure that part of it out. And that's okay. Like (laughs) burpee box jump overs and dumbbell snatches with a toy. He just didn't like those things. (laughs) No, and and man, I just I can't uh, I can't think, move as fast as you guys. Do you think you would those. be better? I'll send you a good video after doing me. that fifty k. Do you think now that you know how like far in the pain cave you can go and still come out alive? Do you think you'd be better? Okay, it's a good question. I would say no, but it's different. At right? aerobic engine, like, the ability to recover there's, and like there's the flush out lactic acid you it'll be interesting when you go back to do some of those workouts because potentially my first year after endurance there was like i'll, I'll never forget this workout it was just like 150 double under 60 wall balls 30 pull-ups there was like a wadapalooza qualifier and i picked up the wall ball and i did 60 in a row 
never have – I came right out of triathlon season, no – no practice, no nothing. Um, and that was like the eye opener for me, like, wow, an aerobic engine can help give you the ability to just flush out any fatigue that I typically would have had in the past. Anyways, just a thought, just a thought. That's a fair point. Mm-hmm. We'll have to get and Greg funny- back on the podcast after he does two more races. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because I think it's interesting to me like to hear you say that coming off of heavy endurance season and then getting back into like yeah. mixed modal functional fitness type workouts because yeah. yeah you've got the big aerobic base but like there is nothing about dumbbell snatches and burpee box jump right. overs that's aerobic not for me anyway because you know in in less than two minutes i'm already over my aerobic heart rate so on one hand, it's like, okay, yeah, you understand the pain cave that's associated with running 50 kilometers. But in my experience doing both, it's very different than what it feels like to sustain a pace of dumbbell snatches and burpee box jump overs with like much higher power output for a short But you might find that you actually do so, that workout having not in an aerobic it. zone. You know, like yeah. my heart rate doesn't go above wow. 80, 80%. 150, 560 beats per minute in a dumbbell snatch and burpee box. I can just keep it there for longer periods of time, right? So, yeah, if you make it in aerobic, yeah, we've talked about this yeah, a lot. Make yeah. it aerobic and see if you can hold that for 12 and a half minutes. You know what I mean? And that's what what you just said is good. Like if you make it, is, it aerobic, it is. but that's a skill. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're saying that as if it's like, you can just start the workout and it's like, well, I've got the aerobic yeah. fitness. So this is just going to be an aerobic workout. And the reason I mention that is because I never learned that 10 years of, of functional fitness training, like hundreds of thousands of reps. And I never learned that until last year doing the open at Polsky's gym. Yeah. And we were doing that dumbbell snatch and burpee box jump over workout. And he somehow convinced me to redo it. And he was like, when you do a dumbbell snatch, he's like, cycle the reps as if you're on the rowing machine or the bike. Because I've always excelled at those type of workouts where it's like, there's a monostructural component that's cyclical and it's fixed, right? As soon as you make that, even an air squat or a dumbbell snatch or a burpee, where the cycle rate is not dictated by the machine, it's dictated by you. Right. It's like my heart rate is just through the roof. And so when Nick said that, he was like, cycle the dumbbell, right. but breathe like you're on the rowing machine. And I was actually like blown away at how much easier it felt to do really big hmm. sets of dumbbell snatching. So that goes back to your point of saying like, you have to make it right. aerobic. It doesn't just Amen. happen by That's accident. That's Polsky nailed it. And I think it's a new, I think it's a That's new cool. concept in the CrossFit world that the elites have been doing forever, but the everyday Joes, they go the first two minutes right. as fast as they can and they cycle that dumbbell as fast as they can. And then all of a sudden they hit the wall three yeah. minutes in. It's like, whoa, hold on a second. Like, sure, you can go the first 30. Hinshaw said this. You can go the first 30 to 45 seconds as hard as you want, but then it's an aerobic workout. So it's, it's, it's so true. Right. Mm-hmm. Cool. Very cool. Um, so you're in CrossFit for a long time and then you transition into your sort of own personal training and coaching. And so your training evolves from being training with your football teammates. You then jump into a CrossFit, which is group fitness. And now we see you pretty much almost always training by yourself. Like how do how did, how did you move to sort of doing training by yourself and being disciplined to sort of continue doing that. Like, do you miss the group training? Like, or do you just feed off of it and you just get the work done? I do miss the group training. Um, sometimes, but I also, I do. And I don't, I guess you could say Mm -hmm. the, the flexibility of being able to train on your own, um, is nice. Like to have your own space, the, 
yeah, it requires probably a little bit more discipline. And in the event that I, if I wanted to compete in anything, I wouldn't be training on my own because I think that environment will always kind of like environment trumps mm-hmm. the best training program, in my opinion, right? Like if you, if you work out next to Adam, you're going to go harder than if you're in the gym, right? like by, by yourself. Right. I think, right. I think most people understand that. Um, mm-hmm. The transition of, of moving from group fitness to, to having my personal training business was, it was that last piece. It was like, I wanted to, to try and start a business. And so okay. at the time I was working at a tech company, um, I knew it wasn't something that I wanted to do long-term. I just, I didn't feel that passionate about software. So <laughs> I had to kind of try and find a way back into fitness. And so uh, the lowest hanging fruit was like, well, I've got the coaching credential. I spent a lot of time coaching movement, seeing people in the gym. If I can somehow sort out a space that I can convince people to come to, um, I think I could really help them. And so that on its own kind of evolved into to personal training, which is what I do full time now. So I mostly work with people one on one. And then as a result, that's the space that I have to train in as well. Yeah, I think Greg, Greg nailed it. In Makes terms sense. Of Makes sense. I think yeah. you've experienced this too. If you have a if you have a focus, like when you're preparing for golf season, let's say, and you want to do a bunch of golf specific preparation, the group training environment might not be the best environment unless the entire group is focused on what you're doing. So it, training on your own has, has huge benefits. If you have like a singular focus, um, that's not like, you know, surrounded by a group of people that have the same singular focus. Mm -hmm. General fitness is what's focused on in, at mm-hmm. limitless in a CrossFit gym, right? Getting stronger, getting more conditioned. Um, and then if you want to do anything specific above and beyond that, it is time for you to go into your own space and, and do that. Right. So best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you need to find expertise and a, a community of people to support you because I think when you take that next step beyond like, GPP and lifestyle fitness, you know, you're, you're committing to something that's going to be quite a bit more challenging. It's going to stretch you. And I think that process is a easier and B it's a lot more enjoyable when you're doing it with with other people that are doing the same thing and it's going to make you better. Totally. And so you have, you, you do CrossFit, obviously you're doing some sports specific training with football how has your training and obviously now endurance is sort of new to you. So maybe at some point we get you back in the pod, we talk about that, but how does, how is your training philosophy sort of transformed? Obviously you don't, you're not a personal trainer for a CrossFit gym. You have your own sort of programming 1440. Like how has your training methodology and concepts like functional fitness, I guess is the best way to sort of suggest what you train. Yeah, perhaps. Um, I, I was recently listening to um, or, or reading some work from a guy named Mark Twite. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, Mark yeah. Twite. Yeah, yeah, you've probably seen some of his stuff. He always talks about 300 what they do. Spartans. Yeah, that's his claim to fame, right? The, yep. the most unconventional, like the last guy you'd expect to be a celebrity fitness trainer, that's Mark Twite. Um, yeah. He actually, but, everyone should check out, he just recently got oh, a feature on the Buttery Bros. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So that's what I was, that's what I was watching. And oh, it was sweet. surprising because like, you don't see a lot of content with those guys, right? Like their, their goal is to kind of fly under the radar with the work that they're doing at nonprofit. They're very focused on an analog experience. That's why they do a lot of digital media. Um, sorry, not digital media. They do a lot of print media, excuse me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but he always talks about what they do and the work that he's done with celebrities over the last decades. He calls it exercise psychology, which I think is really fascinating because there is like no shortage of exercise science and physiology information on the internet, right? We all have that on our smartphones now. So I think like the technical gap of understanding, like, how do I get in better shape is closing. Um, But the gap of like, how do you meet people where they're at and put together a plan that's going to help them be consistent 
and, and support them throughout that process using your experience and your expertise. That's like the exercise psychology piece. So I have had like a bit of an identity crisis in the last couple of years since I started the 1440 because I came from the CrossFit background, but I also have the strength and conditioning from football, but I didn't want to train like athletes per se. I wanted to, to help people that have a curiosity or help people that quite frankly need it. Like they need, they need to start moving. They need to do something for their health or for their life. And I think as a result, like I, I said this before to, uh, to friends in the industry, like I program exercises now that I never would have programmed like three years ago when I was drinking the Kool-Aid hard and CrossFit, because I was like constantly varied functional fitness till you die. Like that's the, that's the key piece, right? Like you've got to be able to snatch and your air squat needs to look like this. And it was like fairly dogmatic. Whereas now it's like, well, if I can just replicate the stimulus for this person who, whose fitness level currently is very different than somebody who, who might walk into a CrossFit gym, like, does it need to be like an overhead squat or can we achieve something similar with like a goblet squat to a box? You know what I mean? So that mm -hmm. has really forced me to like, I think expand the scope of expand the scope of my practice. And I think endurance training falls in that too. Like, three or four years ago, I never would have considered doing an endurance event, but there's got to be something to it. Like why do thousands of people run marathons and triathlons every single year, right? Like there's something to be learned from that experience. And I think a lot of clients, um, you know, have an interest in, in incorporating some of those components into their training. And I want to be able to support that. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you're, you're very diligent in like, researching and understanding other it, it seems that way like you dive into different types of different people in the industry or different types of fitness so it's super cool that you bring somewhat of a you're learning and you're bringing a 360 view into sort of how you coach thank you i'm trying to but there are a lot of times where it's like you've probably felt this way too i'm sure adam has it would just be so much easier to like stay like get in one bucket and just stay there Right. You know what I mean? To say like, no, we just do CrossFit training. Mm -hmm. right? But then you mm -hmm. totally also, you also close yourself off to the possibility of like, well, this person actually doesn't want that CrossFit thing. Mm -hmm. But what if there's something like really great there? Like, what if you could help that person become more capable, more competent, more confident and, uh, and really make a difference. But you might never have that opportunity if, you know, if, if they have zero interest in doing something like CrossFit. Yeah. I mean, it's tough to stay in your lane. And I mean, I, you could argue that it's not the right way of doing things either, right? Like you can't innovate and you can't totally. adapt if you're, if you're just blinded by everything else that's going on, right? Like CrossFit is very good at being CrossFit, right? But then you have a lot of people that teach CrossFit that have started to look around, right? I'm, I'm sure, you know, all the different programs like Mayhem or, or Comp Train or all the big, I'm, they can't ignore what's going on outside CrossFit, right? Whether they actually, decide to say that, yeah, I brought this from this endurance world and, and whatever, right? Like it, it's tough for sure. But yeah, well, everything yeah, is, it, is constantly trying to test that too, right? Like, yeah, they, they have, it, it's weightlifting, it's powerlifting, there's gymnastics, there's kettlebells, there's endurance type events, right? So I think as a mm -hmm. sport, like the sport of fitness, they're, they're doing a good job in, in a similar fashion. Like they're trying to trying to understand these different realms of fitness and, and incorporate them into the sport of CrossFit. Um, but in a weird way, it's kind of become like its own thing. You know what I mean? It's like, well, yeah, CrossFit is now this, sure. this bucket that stands on its own, even though it has, you know, water from all these other buckets too. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I wanted to ask you, cause like a lot has changed in the fitness world in the past few years, obviously with the pandemic and just all the craziness happening in the world. Um, I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on the sort of future of fitness. Like, and uh, yeah, like, what do you think? Like from a coaching perspective, you're running your own business. Uh, obviously, Adam, you, you run your own business. Like, do you guys think about these things? Are you trying to sort of forecast what's about to happen? Like, obviously the pandemic, you didn't know that was going to happen, but like, do you have any ideas of what the future of fitness looks like? Are you waiting for me to go first, Adam? <laughs> I can go quick and then I'll let you. You're the, you're the, 
special guest today. You know, it's so funny because during the pandemic, everyone was like, oh my God, the future of fitness is online. Uh, it's easy. It's convenient. You know, people are just going to be able to do it from home. And then we quickly realized that we missed community and connection and all of that. Right. So I would, I would like to think that the future of fitness is more based around community and experience and, uh, personal connection. Um, the world is back <laughs> to full speed ahead, like maybe more than ever. I feel like all the families that we're surrounded by at the gym are busier than ever and being efficient, being, uh, you know, quality over quantity, um, structure, accountability, support, all of those things are going to be more important than ever because, um, without that, you're just going to let your fitness and health take the back seat in a world where it's way too easy for it to take the back seat. Um, so I think, I think it's community and, and the people around you are going to be the number one thing to support you. Yeah, I would, I would piggyback on that. I like that you brought up the pandemic because I felt like that at the beginning too. Um, especially not being able to do personal training or, or seeing people in person where it's, you have the biggest opportunity to make an impact when you can work with someone one-on-one, -on -one. just like when the members come through the door at LP, that is like, that's the pinnacle coaching experience, right? And everything else, even though you guys do a great job with the online stuff, it's not the same because you can't make corrections in real time and you can't provide the equipment and the environment. Um, so I am happy to see that things have kind of rebounded, especially within the last few months, but I think it did kind of expose a bit of a trend and you're seeing, you know, the best in the industry do this well, is that everything online supports and enhances the in-person experience, or it's like an extension mm -hmm. of that environment, right? So it's like, as much as people want that community and they need that community to help them be consistent. They also need opportunities for customization so that they can be consistent over the very long term. Because I bet you, you know, Adam, you've got probably 25% of your members are on vacation right now or they're taking off this weekend for a wedding. Just like 25% of my clients every week are, are missing their, their in person session with me. And they're like, you know, we're doing this trip and we're taking so the like work life fitness balance. Um, you know, and how do you create an environment, a community that like supports you in all those different places so that, you know, over the long run, it's like, you know, training is a normal part of my life and my gym supports that. It's not like I need to be in this one spot in order to get the fitness that I signed up for. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's yeah, tough I've... though. It's tough. Like to. No, but I, the, the cool thing is now just like businesses are okay with having meetings online and not that corporate travel is not back to full speed ahead. But like if my one-on-one -on -one clients travel, like we, we connect on FaceTime and we do workouts wherever they are. So that's super cool. Figuring that out in the group uh, environment, I think is like you said, very, very important. Um, Challenging, mm -hmm. but important because an active lifestyle is an active lifestyle, especially if you're traveling like, you know, 10 weeks a year, you're just yeah. not in a physical location, right? Are you just going to take those 10 weeks off of your fitness and health? Or are you going to build in an active lifestyle around that? I think if I could circle back on this, one other point worth mentioning here, I think we're both kind of like we're circling it right now is, and I felt this during the pandemic as well. A lot of people would ask me like, are you going to run zoom sessions? Basically, are you going to get on zoom and watch your clients work out in the living room? And I kind of felt like on one hand, if that's the accountability that they need, then I would consider supporting that. But on the other hand, I also felt like as a coach, if I haven't in the time that we've worked together, given them the tools that they need to figure out how to read a workout and complete it on their own, 
then I think I'd maybe failed them as a coach. So if we're going to have this in-person experience and then augment and support it with different channels online, I don't think programming matters that much. It's like a more fundamental job as a coach is like, you need to teach people how to work out. Like, how do you read a workout? How do you understand this? And how do you apply the concept that's like, yes, you need to be able to understand the technical components of a squat and a lunge. But if I give you a hundred air squats with, you know, 10 burpees on the minute or whatever that freaking workout was that we did for the at home fitness challenge. Like if I write that on a piece of paper and I give you demo videos and notes, are you going to be able to take that and execute it while you're at the beach with your family? Like the same, you know what I mean? So it's like, if we're missing that piece, I think that's the, the, the deeper layer of coaching that will help set us up for, for more success in the long run. I don't, I don't think that programming and, and fancy stuff matters as much. I think it's like fundamentally teaching people how to work out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially people truly invested in their own health and wellness, right? right? Right. And that's, that's, I think back to this celebrity trainer, you guys were talking about, you know, exercise psychology is like, not just the the program matters, but the the mindset around it and the the education around it is just as important. Totally. I think, I mean, I'll, I'll give my take on the future fitness, even though it's probably not wanted, but hearing it from your perspective, because you're not thinking of it from like necessarily a business owner perspective, but more like as an end user perspective. Okay. Thanks for the encouragement. Appreciate Your that. Perspective <laughs> is actually the most important of the oh, three. Oh, boys, keep it, keep it coming, <laughs> keep it coming, keep it coming. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I feel like um, what COVID did was really, I don't know if it unlocked curiosity or I feel like individuals in fitness sort of sprawled out and maybe got a nudge of different types of fitness. Like obviously endurance sports sort of blew up, Peloton blew up. We, and now like, just looking at CrossFit in itself, like you have all these like additions to CrossFit. You have like the high rocks and you have these deck of fits and you have these like Spartan type stuff. Like I feel like fitness is really sort of sprawled out and individuals that might've been in their lane in CrossFit, right? They go to the gym every day, they do their hour of fitness, they clock out and they're, they're super passionate about CrossFit. But I feel like now it's like, maybe I want to get a sports specific golf training because now I can measure, I can go from CrossFit as my foundation and I can jump into sports specific. So I feel like, individuals have started really to kind of sprawl out and test other things where maybe in the before COVID they were kind of just staying in their lane, right? We're just going through the motions and we just believed in whatever you did. So I feel like now it's like you and I talked with this, Adam, you were saying like individuals that might be at the gym six days a week might only be in the gym three days a week now. And now they're jumping into, they're going home and they're doing a long Peloton thing, or they're doing a long outdoor run or a bike. So I feel like that's where I see fitness is kind of becoming more of this like sprawled out factor where you might 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 not just be drinking the CrossFit Kool-Aid. You'll be doing endurance and CrossFit or bodybuilding and, or some sort of hypertrophy training and endurance or something like that. That's my take. Man, Chad just dropping dimes on us because that's the interesting point. And to, to shift back to like a business owner perspective, I think, a less mature version of Greg and a less mature version of ADJ would have this experience where one of their clients goes, Hey, I got a Peloton. What do you think about that? And you'd be like, shit, like they don't like my workouts. Um, you know, how is this going to fit in the training plan? Like, you know, even if I think that it's just a fad, they're, they're excited about this thing. So it's like, how do you build that into the training plan? And that's the customizable element that I was trying to talk about. Like, I have a lot of clients that they come to see me one day per week in person and I give them like as much GPP as we can. And we utilize the tools that they don't have access to on their own, like barbells and, you know, a skier or GHD machine, whatever the specialty equipment is. And then at home, they've probably got a set of kettlebells, maybe a barbell, or they've got a Peloton or they like to run or they like to mountain bike. And then I, I build those things into their training plan over the course of the week. So it's like, I give you the 60% of strength and conditioning that you need that I know belongs in a well-rounded training program. But I also want to support this curiosity that you have about playing golf 
or taking up a new hobby or getting out and riding your bike with your family. And I think that it's important not to like stifle that creativity or that curiosity because that's like such a seed for commitment that I've seen a lot of those things have stuck with my clients for the last couple of years. Um, so that's a really, really good point, Chad. Thanks for bringing it up. No, that's it's so true. I mean, Adam has been my coach for eight years now. And I remember uh, a few years, I, no, two years, I was like, I really want to do this hypertrophy thunder growth program. And yeah. I was a little bit like, not scared, but just like timid about asking, talking to Adam about it. But I'm like, no, he'll understand it now. Like, and I would say when I first met you, like two years ago, you'd be like, no, you're an idiot. Don't do that stupid shit. But like, for sure, Luke, like Adam has been like super open to that idea. So I think you're right. Um, you guys are much mature. And I think with the industry growing and going through this like significant moment in time with COVID, um, I think even coaches and like business owners in, in the fitness industry have like really matured and understood like, you got to be open to this like large, like you just, it's not a one way street. It's just not a one way lane. Right. So. Awesome, man. Well, man, I mean, Greg, this has been awesome. I can't believe it's taken us this long, 54 episodes to get you or 55 episodes to get you on the podcast. We have to do this again. I feel like this has been an awesome conversation about fitness and training. We didn't even dive into nutrition, which we can maybe do that another time. But thanks so much for joining the podcast, dude. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I love what you guys are doing. So just as much as maybe you would say to stroke my ego that I'm inspiring you guys, you're inspiring me. So super happy to be here and I uh, hope we get to do it again soon. Yeah, man. So, yeah. So thank you. Thanks, Coach ADJ. Appreciate the conversation. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. We'll see you in the gym. Bye, everyone. <laughs>